Thanks for tuning in to the Empire Boxing Podcast. A huge thank you to our partners at Sting Boxing. It doesn't matter if you're into boxing for fitness, as an amateur, or as a pro, Sting has something for you. Head to their website, stingsports.ca, and use the code EMPIRE10 at the checkout to receive 10% off. An Empire Boxing and Unlearning Network production. Welcome back to another episode of the Empire Boxing Podcast. I'm your host, Coach Jay, and we have a special co-host today, Mr. Daniel Norman. What's up? What's up? Uh, yeah, right? <laughs> Leader of the Empire Boxing Breakdown. You may have seen it on our social reels. And we have a very special guest in the house tonight. We have Manny Sabral, former Canadian and IBO champion in the super welterweight division. And Manny represented Canada in the 1988 Summer Olympics in Seoul, Korea. And now Manny is a coach to many amateur and pro fighters that are based out of BC. So passing the torch. <laughs> Welcome to the show, Manny. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. It's really great to be here. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean this is a you, special Thanks. trifecta today yeah. that we have. This is good. Uh, <laughs> Manny, I want to bring it right to you right off the yeah, gate. Yeah. Tell me about your boxing origin story. How did it all start for you? It was really by accident because, um, you know, I was grew up in the east end of Vancouver and by Nanaimo and Hastings. And, uh, you know, grade seven to grade eight is a big change for kids, right? So I was a chubby kid and I had a nickname as I was running across the field. And, it, you know, like this, the lingo of da -da -da, Batman, well, kids used to go da da da, -da fat man. Oh, that yeah. was me, right? Oh, so I was a chubby kid, ruthless, ruthless uh, 12 year olds, 11 year olds. And so, you know, I I looked on Google. Well, the yellow pages of the day was Google of today. Mm -hmm. So I right. looked at the yellow pages and looked for gyms. And the closest gym to my place was a cl place called the Inner City Gym, which was on Maine and Hastings, which uh, was kind of a rough area, but it was summertime. So my parents actually let me go down there. So I took the Hastings bus to get to Hastings in Maine, went and knocked on the door. And it was early in the morning, about 11.30 in the morning, and I didn't know what I was going to do. I just was going to lift weights, look like Arnold Schwarzenegger, I thought, of right? Of course, so, yeah, like and, in a matter of yeah, weeks, yeah, really. Yeah. Over the summer, yeah, of it was course. going to change. <laughs> a couple because, months. Yeah, so. I was going to be a different kid for grade 8, right? Because yeah. I wanted to really, you know, going to high school, you're kind of, you know, you're wondering, oh, what's it going to be like and everything mm -hmm. else, right? So sure. I was no different than any other kid, and I was a chubby kid. And, you know, around that time, too, you're – balances the balance of your different hormones going through your body changes so you know you start getting some people get attracted to the same sex some people get attracted to the opposite sex i was one of the people that got attracted to the opposite sex so right. you know i was so interested in that 12 year old babes yeah <laughs> Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, this you, bicep's got to be at least two inches well, bigger if i'm yeah. gonna exactly and i mean I used to go to this pool called the, what was it called? New Brighton Pool. And I used to, oh, yeah. the chicks were hot, man. Right. And I'm going, oh my God. Right. <laughs> yeah. So I got to work out. I got to work out hard. <laughs> so I got to get to this gym, right? So I had to go into the gym, but the gym wasn't open. At 11.30 in the morning, it didn't open until 12. But I saw this older gentleman sweeping up the floor and he looked up and then, you know, I kept knocking on the door and then he'd shake his head and keep sweeping and I'd knock on the door some more. Not today, kid. Yeah. yeah. So, but he eventually came out. His name ended up being Steve Valenchek. He was an older gentleman and he opens the door and goes, what do you want? And I jump yeah. back 20 feet and I go, oh, I don't know. I, I want, want the babes work. at the brain pool, <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah. Well, that's ultimately <laughs> what I wanted, but I would, no, I want to work out. Well, what are you going to do to work out? I'm going, I'm going to lift some weights and ride the bike. No, you're not. You're going to box. <laughs> so you'd hold the pads for me, like at 11 11 o'clock in the morning. So, and, so wait, this guy drops the broom yeah. and just gets the pads on, and then here well, we go. Well, he said, kid, you want to wow. do it? You better do it, sort mm. of thing. And, you know, he he told me stories that he'd sparred with Rocky Marciano and he Were these uh, stories true? Did eventually mm, did we It's hard to say whether they were or not. I know that he did box. Like he had yeah. like there wasn't box record or anything you can check up on and, and this was nineteen eighty one, so there's no internet, so I couldn't check up on it. But people right. around the gym did say, Yeah, yeah, Steve was a tough kid, he was a tough man and this and that. Mm -hmm. and probably had some fights, who knows? And there was a story that Rocky Marciano did come by through Vancouver at one time. So ah, okay. he may have, there's a possibility. And regardless, he knew the basics of a jab and a right hand. Mm -hmm. And I think he taught me to sort of right. And by the end of that summer, I didn't lift weights. I just, I lost about 20 pounds. So I was, went down from like 150 down to 130 and um, I kept losing weight because I didn't box until I was about one. My first match was at 119 and 
my parents wouldn't let me go down there at nighttime because of the shady area that it right. was. Nowhere near where it is today, but it was still, you know, a lot of alcoholism and yeah. stuff around there. And mm-hmm. At that time, were you uh, sp- sparring at all? Mm, I started sparring, like, within a month. He already yeah. had me go and spar, and there's other people, like, all all older people. Like, I was the youngest person there, and mm-hmm. uh, oh, yeah. at that time, there was a guy named Gordy Reset that was boxing, and mm-hmm. I thought, oh, Gordy. Like, I remember him coming in the gym, and he was just a monster of a man, like, and... I'm looking up to him going, oh, my God, I want to be like that, right? Wow. <laughs> like, yeah. And, uh, but it was a good gym, too. There's uh, a lot of people that pass through there. Like, from what I heard, like, Muhammad Ali trained there when he trained in North Van at the the Eagles gym, and he also trained at Did the you know inner that? city gym. Wow, no, That's I didn't crazy. know that. Yeah, what trained, history. Yeah, crazy. Yeah. So Muhammad Ali, when he came through town, he fought George Chevallo, and Chevallo yeah. trained at that inner city gym. And a lot of great great fighters. There's a guy named Lloyd Hunnigan that stopped there, I remember, because I sparred with Lloyd when I was a kid still. Uh, he came through town. And also a guy named Hilario Zapata, who was a world flyweight champion. I got to spar with him. This is about two years after I started, but he mm-hmm. came through town because he was going to go fight in Japan. So he stopped in Vancouver to get over to Japan. So he stopped wow. for like a week or something. So he, mm-hmm. he was in the gym. And I, I mean, it was just phenomenal the opportunities I got. And, and I was very fortunate to have done that. But the important thing is that, you know, you sort of have to go out and research, not necessarily research it. Yeah, Google it. Yeah. Find out where to go. You want to do something? You want to be an artist? If you want to be a magician, go find out where the magicians are. Go there. Right. Mm-hmm. If you want to be an artist, go find out where the artist is. I wanted to be, I didn't necessarily want to be a boxer, yeah. but I wanted to work out. So if you yeah. want to work out, go work out. But you don't know what it's going to lead to yeah, exactly. unless you try, right? So that's what happened with me. Like n- no one in my family, none of my friends, no one ever boxed. And I just mm-hmm. started boxing. And it's kind of one of those things that gravitated to it. And I was reading every Ring magazine possible. I was reading every KO magazine possible. I was reading every magazine possible. I was reading books on boxing. I was... So instantly, you just instantly, felt like, yeah. hey, this is my thing. <clears throat> yeah, because this old man, Steve Valenchik, showed Shout an interest. Out to Steve. Yeah. So I got to know then, heading back into to high school, running yeah. across the field, did yeah. the kids change their tune? Like, were you Batman? No. Did I they ever pick on you, like, physically? Mm. Like, try to beat you up or anything? Well... That started early because I came to Canada when I was six years old. So I was just thrown into grade one. I came from Spain, so I didn't know a word yeah, of, of English. So no. I remember I used to get picked on a little bit. But for some reason, I never really, like, I just laughed it off. And I was always mm-hmm. the bigger kid. Like, I grew, like, I was, like, I was 150 pounds at grade eight. <laughs> or wow. grade, grade, sorry, grade seven. Grade right. eight, I was about 130. And I did get down to 120. That was my first boxing match. Um, but I was probably five seven at the time. So I was kind of one of the taller kids. And I, because of that, I was able to just push myself around mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. never really got into trouble. And, and bullying back in, it wasn't a word back in the eighties, yeah. right? Like you get pushed around, you get pushed around. And it, it wasn't, I think the more you talk about it, the more you, <sighs> I don't know what word I'm looking for, but the more you you perpetuate it, the more it's going to happen or the more the people, even people that aren't getting really bullied, they're just being told what to do. Oh, I'm getting bullied. (laughs) Right. You know, but it wasn't like that then. And, um, do you think, do you think younger kids and, and growing up in that kind of era had a bit higher level resilience to like, you know, adversity in, in school and, and, you know, teachers and other classmates, do you think there was just a, a general expected level of toughness that was a little higher then? It was different too because there wasn't because nowadays if something happens the whole world knows because it goes on mm-hmm. the net for sure and, and yeah. I would say that like cyberbullying is almost worse than physical bullying yeah. because it, I mean, it depends you. on the severity yeah. obviously no. but yeah exactly and it can spread it so fast it's twenty four right? hours a day you can yeah. ruin someone's life yeah. you can ruin yeah. their job opportunities Brutal. you can ruin yeah yeah so I would say that's almost worse mm-hmm. yeah so I'm yeah I was picked on because I didn't know the language. And I remember not even knowing how to ask to go to the washroom. But I remember I used to use sign language to the teacher. And yeah, yeah. Pointing <laughs> and she remember take, I remember her taking me. She figured it out. Yeah, <laughs> taking me oh, okay. how, how's your Spanish now? Muy bien. Hablo yeah. español. Tú hablas español también. Un poquito. All right, Necesito this is where the podcast más, yeah. wraps up. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. But I find there's more and more Spanish-speaking people in the lower mainland, so I get yeah. to practice quite a bit. So yeah, for sure. a lot of people from... All over the world, like I mean, mm-hmm. Spain is spoken all over 
North and South mm-hmm. America, really. Yeah. Yeah. I think one of the coolest things about having you on the show is that you can really speak to that sort of era of boxing mm-hmm. that it was the that, high. Right. I yeah. mean, so what like so nowadays, you know, we're not really hearing stories about these, you know, high level pros stopping mm-hmm. through even Canada. Like I guess mm-hmm. maybe Ontario probably a little bit more, but right. what do you think was a major factor that changed why Vancouver kind of stopped being the spot to hit, or let's say BC for some of these <sighs> higher level pros? Well, it sort of happened in a way. Like, I mean, it's been a few years, but I mean, Manny Pacquiao and um, what's the guy's name? Amir Khan. Amir Khan stopped yeah. through like within the last 10 years type mm-hmm. thing. And yeah. um, so it does happen, but. It definitely yeah. seems like there was like a golden era kind of at that yeah. time. Yeah, there's a lot more. I yeah, mean, and there's other fighters Pat, too. Yeah, Dale Michael Lodgett. Yeah, yeah, Michael Lodgett is probably. You know, like Michael Olaje going the distance with Thomas Hearns and yeah. giving him a yeah. boat. And then... Aaron Barkley. Aaron Barkley. Yeah. It's such cool history, right? Yeah. So, so, so good. I mean, that was a real good gym too. The Kingsway Boxing Gym that his old man sort of ran. And there was a lot of good boxers out mm. of there. Like a guy named Geeka Singh. Uh, there was a guy named Jamie Olenberger that was really good. Yeah. There's... Um, I'm I'm forgetting a lot of names, but there's a lot of good boxers yeah. out of that. Manny, um, one thing I want to know is mm-hmm. uh, from your day when you started boxing mm-hmm. to today's gyms that you see now, like mm-hmm. what is a big difference in training methods that you mm-hmm. notice? Well, I think it seemed back in the day people were a bit more serious about it. Now they take it more sort of, oh yeah, like I'm just doing it because I want to just be a rock star, be a rock star or, or <laughs> get a get a get a clip on me to go yeah. to get some looks on Facebook or whatever. Whereas yeah. back then, as people like did, clout chasing, yeah, mm. yeah, because now they, back then people just want to do it because their heart was into doing it, right? Exactly. And there was a lot of real rough and tough mm-hmm. guys. Like I mm-hmm. remember because they had, had pro fights, and you know these guys are just so rough and tough. Like there was a guy named Mike Baldoon. He was like a middleweight, and man, that guy was rough and tough, and like. Yeah. I might, I seen Mike maybe five, six years ago, and he's you know sort of like in a state of Jarmo Bay. I don't know if you remember Jarmo yeah, Bay, but yeah, Jarmo yeah. was a phenomenal boxer, yeah. and now he's on the downtown very sad east, story, yeah. very downtown mm-hmm. side. But there was a lot of those sad stories, and it's mm-hmm. unfortunate that it came that way. But these were people that came from somewhat fractured families mm-hmm. yeah. that found boxing that gave them their family. You know? right. mm-hmm. It made them really, really rough and tough, and they didn't want to give mm-hmm. up, man. And they they left it in the ring. It seems like a kind of a, almost like a classic tale in boxing, isn't yeah. it? Is like mm-hmm. the the kids from the actually it's such a nice way of putting it. The fractured homes, the yeah. rough mm-hmm. backgrounds. Mm-hmm. What what do you think it is about boxing that attracts kids like that? Uh, it's it's a family. I mean, boxing yeah. is a real family because when you see a boxing match, it's really a microcosm of life because you mm-hmm. start off and, and you know everything's going good. All of a sudden, you get caught with a shot, then f- everything's. You got to get, you got to pick yourself up from the ground, Mm -hmm. just like real life, man. And then if you don't, you keep sinking. So you got to do it. You got to, you got to really get rough and tough and get out there. Same as in real life. When job opportunities don't open up, you don't just give up and say, oh, fuck, I can't get a job, right? You Mm -hmm. just, you got to, you got to go out there and fight for it. And same sort of thing in boxing. If Mm -hmm. you want to get out of the second round, you got to fight for it. Mm. Yeah, and then going back to Dan's question about training methodologies. So mm-hmm. it seems like there's a culture piece to that around boxing. What about yeah. actual technical training uh, modalities? Mm, I would, I couldn't think of any. I mean, I, Do you think I it's know evolved at all. It, Boxing is one of those things that, you know, they're doing the same thing training in the 40s that they're doing today, I think. Mm-hmm. There's a few differences like plyometrics and explosive training yeah. mm-hmm. and high intensity stuff that they didn't do necessarily back then. They just jogged for f- five miles. 100 sit ups, 100 yeah, push ups. Yeah, yeah. Go run, come yeah, back exactly. if you're alive. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But now they can do it, intensify it, and explode yes. and then recuperate yeah. and this and that. But um, what I can say is one of the. <laughs> the gyms that I know this happened for three months, you go into this gym and mm-hmm. all you could use is your jab and you had yeah. to catch the right hand in front of your yeah. chin like this, which leaves you open for a left hook, but it worked. Yeah. Mm. And that was Michael Elogity senior. That's how we tr- trained mm-hmm. all his boxers. But when you looked at Michael Elogity junior, he had his hands like this, not like this. Yeah. Mm. So his dad trained him a little different, but he knew that this style, yeah. this style, worked because you catch the jab you don't get touched with the amateur boxing it's the amount of time mm-hmm. you get touched right yeah. so 
it made that gym really good. It was that, one of the better gyms. That was gyms. one thing that I was going to say was um, it seemed like back then, back then they really focused on the fundamentals yeah. and making sure that you get it right before you yeah. move on to something else yeah. where today, you know, it's so popular online and everything and people just want to come in and do the pad work and do yeah. crazy combinations right off the bat, but yeah. you don't necessarily progress as a boxer that way, you know, and a, a lot of times now you see newer fighters not really using their jab, mm -hmm. you know, and they're just... Yeah. Doing the flashy stuff, right? I agree. I agree. And the jab's the most important thing because what it yeah. does is it measures your distance. And it's all mm. about distance. Boxing, if you're not within distance, you can't hit your opponent. If you're too close to your opponent, it's a lot easier to get hit back. So if you got yeah. the right distance, you can pull on punches like mm -hmm. Mayweather does. Like yeah. Mayweather's got his guy oh, on yeah. the end of his jab all the yeah. time it's because a, he can yeah. always do the Mayweather pull. Matter yeah. of inches, really. Yeah. Millimeters. Even. Millimeters. Yeah. Yeah. I it's, love his jab to the body. Oh, I know. Because yeah. it throws his people off. throws yeah. people off. It's so interesting what you said, Dan. Like, I think I think that's all part of like sort of this cultural glitch that mm -hmm. we're experiencing now, where everyone wants instant gratification, yeah. yes. clout, yeah, clout chasing, and it it really does. And I think it's it's interesting because you know, on one hand, coaches have a duty to their client or their mm -hmm. athlete to mm -hmm. teach them the fundamentals mm -hmm. and to to help them be progressive and good at something. Mm -hmm. And then I think like the 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 sort of like uprising of fitness boxing takes boxing out of its content or co sorry context mm -hmm. and then is like a supercharged high speed version of just trying to like look good for a video. So then mm -hmm. we miss all the fundamentals and that's a lot of the people you see super stagnant in the sport. They never progress, they never understand, they don't know how to connect their feet to their hands. There there is yeah. The movement, the biomechanics is all. And it's really hard for coaches to undo bad habits versus just mm -hmm. teaching someone right to begin mm -hmm. with. Yeah. But what that requires is their patience and understanding mm -hmm. and what yeah. they're actually doing long term, right? Yeah. But they look great on pads in the bag. Ev <laughs> hopefully, eventually. And that's yeah. the thing, you know, like, because this is a business, right? When when mm -hmm. you have a gym and, and they want to keep them coming back, right? Mm -hmm. And if they're doing a job for three months, you're probably going to lose them. They're going to get bored, right? right. So mm -hmm. that instant gratification, yeah. like you said, is a big piece to keep keeping the the, mm -hmm. the people coming back and mm -hmm. having that retention right yeah but it's so simple you look like look at a guy like bivol mm -hmm. mm -hmm. he just used that jab and distance with canelo and canelo yeah. couldn't touch him yeah right. but everyone says oh yeah he's so much bigger and so much but if he would have given up space to canelo mm -hmm. and let him come in it would have been a different fight but Absolutely. he kept him at his range well, with his yes. jab he and, knew he had yeah. to the range was the yeah. only way through that and his in and out yeah. movement's really That's good it. Yeah. But that's all distance. Yeah. Muhammad Ali's the same thing. He bounced around at his distance, and yeah. guys, he just pulled back, couldn't hit him. And so Floyd's the same way, really. Here's a mm -hmm. question for both of you guys: What do you think would happen to boxing, the 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 fitness industry, mm -hmm. if coaches were like, "I don't care. You're doing footwork for three weeks, whether you like it. We're doing the job for a month. Like, take mm -hmm. it or leave it." What do you think would happen? You think it would just crumble? Well, the fitness part of it might because people will get bored, like Dan was saying, but mm -hmm. it depends what the person wants out of it. Mm. Right? And they yeah. got to sort of, it, it's a very difficult thing though, because if someone tells you, okay, you got to do this, well, how the hell, how, the, how do you know yeah. what's good for me, right? Like I've been watching videos and I see this guy doing this mm -hmm. and that, and I get so much of this, right. and why don't you yeah. do it like this? And I said, well, you can do it like that, but... I just think it might be better like this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a little know. bit of discipline that gets mm -hmm. sort of removed from the equation too, yeah. right? Like, yeah. like the student coming in and just yeah. understanding that there's a, there's an element of right. dis discipline. Like, yeah. I, I I'm here to do what mm -hmm. you think is best. Yeah, mm -hmm. but no one really knows what's best because if Muhammad Ali <laughs> had not been able to do what he did, he wouldn't have been Muhammad Ali. If Muhammad Ali went and trained with Archie Moore, who was a great fighter. Mm -hmm. And they didn't get along because Archie wanted him to do it his way. Yeah. Then he went to Angelo Dundee, and Angelo Dundee understood, well, mm -hmm. why make him something he's not? Right. So, yeah. you you know, okay, your hands are down. Like, I mean, someone's going to take right. your head off, right? Yeah. And I don't, you know, but the thing about it, about that is that you got to have the reflexes to be able to box like mm -hmm. that. Mm. Very few people have that. Roy Jones yeah. had that until he got older, and then yeah. Antonio Tarver caught him, and... Joe uh, Johnson, uh, Glenn Johnson, Glenn Johnson caught yeah. him. Oh, that was so, a bad one. I know Ooh. it was, but he yeah. had that been two or three years earlier, there's no way Glenn Johnson would have caught Roy mm. Jones. Yeah, but that's sure. such a fine line, right? Yeah. And 
And what happened this weekend? A guy named Liam Smith fought a guy yeah. named Eubank. Eubank. Yeah, Eubank. Chris Eubank. Chris, what an up- was, yeah, that was like Chris, a big upset. But, but Chris Eubank was short box like Roy Jones. Yeah. And I was yeah. with a few friends. I said, he's going to get caught with the right hand. Yeah. And when he got to that corner, he couldn't yep. get back up away from it. He got caught with the right hand, mm-hmm. yeah. left uppercut, right hand, left hook, and he's out. There's yeah. only ro- one Roy Jones, you know. There like is. In- and I mean, Roy is coaching in his corner yeah. and stuff. And, mm-hmm. and I had a few, co- I had some conversations before that with Russ Amber, who's on Liam's Mm-hmm. So I had a little bit of an insight of what was going to happen too, and yeah. I kind of, I sort of knew that that they've been working on that right hand too. Yeah. So and he he came in with a high guard, you know, yeah. like so he yeah, yeah. he wasn't open, like exactly. he, he had nice tight defense, and they had the perfect game plan. Perfect, yeah, and real classic boxer, right? Yeah, like it was beautiful, yeah. beautiful to watch. His and, fight against Canelo, yeah. man, I was so I impressed. Yeah. Like I was I like, know. wow, this guy's yeah. really good. Yeah. He's, there's a lot of good fighters out there. Yeah. There's just there's fine lines that make got great guys and guys mm-hmm. that are good, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's very those very those like more like brash sort of bravado flashy styles are are really attractive to people. Yeah. But yeah. you're right, far and few between. There's mm-hmm. an element of like, yeah. do you really have what it takes to fight successfully in this style? Is Ryan Garcia gonna get caught by Tank Davis? No. <laughs> I mean, I'm leaning on yes. Yeah. I'm leaning on yes with I that. I think so too. So Manny, when you go to coach like a beginner, like you've yeah. got a, a fresh amateur, let's yeah. let's let's say someone yeah. who is interested in they think at that time going right. the distance in Somewhere. boxing. What are some of the first fundamentals you teach them about? Like what style, the defensive things, what are, how, what's your checklist with a new person? Just the jab, learning the jab and the distance. I get them to, yeah. you know, throw their arm out on a bag and then circle the bag with their arm out, right? So they know the distance between themselves and the bag. So mm-hmm. it's the circumference around mm-hmm. the circle that they shouldn't get in that circle mm-hmm. unless they're ready to go or unless they got their guard up or that's something. a good drill. I like that. Mm-hmm. And yeah. um, so once they got that distance, then they can work with it, right? And everything mm-hmm. goes from that distance because they know if they reach there, all they have to do is just pull a little bit and they're away from yeah. it because their mm-hmm. opponent can't have that bigger bar reach than they got. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And um, and to try to understand that that's how you win matches and then get them to change the pace, I think is very important too. It's like, mm-hmm. you know, do two or three jabs, bah, boom, right. and then go back to the jab. And then mm-hmm. you got your distance and cover up and move. And as long yeah. as you can move and parry punches out of the way, mm-hmm. sort of like the Mike, Michael Lodge senior, I don't have them hold their hand in front of their face, mm-hmm. but you know, I noticed Tony kind of did that too. Tony Pep does it, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. Tony had to do the Michael Lodgety Senior yeah. boxing for three months before he even got to do anything oh, else. Really? Wow. Yeah. And that's why he had that style, right? And he still does. And Tony's yeah. amazing at pulling and oh, coming man. back with the right mm-hmm. hand. Because yeah, I got caught with a few of those and he <laughs> can yeah. punch. So like sharp. for a 126-pounder, that guy. Oh, he it's can like hit. a freight train. He has a good left hook to the body too. I swear oh, I know, liver. Liver yeah. shots, you know. Wow. Yeah. He's fought some of the best. I, yeah. Tony's... No slouch, you know. Yeah. I mean, he's got his own issues, as, as everybody does. But mm-hmm. uh, the guy understands and knows boxing. That guy, mm-hmm. yeah, because he's been everywhere. He was at our last event. So yeah. It was really nice to see yeah, him. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. I remember seeing him there. Yeah. yeah, it was great to see him. Good guy. How much emphasis do you put on footwork, and what styles of footwork do you utilize for a beginner? In terms of footwork, I like footwork that's wide, wider stance because then you can move your waist more. Whereas if you have a narrow stance, you barely be able to move your waist. And your waist is get you out of a lot of situations. It allows you to mm-hmm. slip punches. It allows you to pull punches. It allows you to cushion shots. And so a bit wider than shoulder width. And of course, don't want to be in a straight line because when you tip over, you yeah. know, be in like a triangle sort of shape. And uh, yeah, as long as you don't cross your feet, try to drill that mm-hmm. i always do you know shuffle forward shuffle back shuffle to the right shuffle mm-hmm. to the left and a lot of shuffling and never want to land with your heels because then i get them to walk around on their heels well it's pretty hard to walk <laughs> on your heels right mm-hmm. yeah. so why would you do that in boxing why <laughs> yeah. would you land why would you step over and land on your heel because for that split second you're yeah. stuck um but you watch boxing you see the guys do it all the time but that's when they're out of range but yeah. when they're in range and in the pocket mm-hmm. They're sharper, right? Mm-hmm. So I also try to make people understand that there's times where you got to be on form and ready to go, and there's other times where you can do whatever you want. Be relaxed. When, yeah. you know, when you're out of range, right? It's almost like there's like a syllabus, and, mm-hmm. and then you watch like pro boxing, mm-hmm. and it's like the cheat code of the syllabus, right? Mm-hmm. And it's people that once you've developed your skills to like such a high level, yeah. you realize what what you can, can wiggle do. with and what you can't, right? Yeah, but I sure. think that that original syllabus is super important to kind of yeah. give people context behind everything. What's your go-to when you're coaching? Um, the job. 
uh, footwork, balance, you know, those are like key things that I try to drill in mm-hmm. and make sure that they really get the footwork down, like the movement forward, side to side, lateral movement. Um, because without balance, you, you just start falling all over the place, mm-hmm. right? Even when you're blocking punches, right? Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, like Manny said, you know, like not fighting on the tightrope where you're, yeah. you have such a narrow stance, right? Yeah, absolutely. And uh, yeah, just keeping the chin down, you know, head slightly off center, that mm-hmm. kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. So just teaching them the, the basic concepts so that um, it's like a checklist ingrained mm-hmm. in their head, you know, like, and they don't forget it. Yeah. yeah. One of the main things I talk about getting offline is that you don't want to be in the, you don't want your head in the same spot from where you punch because yeah. your opponent's going to punch back where the punch came from. So mm-hmm. if you're always there, if it's yeah. always on that line, yeah. you're going to get hit. Like the guy go hit you with their eyes closed. Mm-hmm. Whereas if you punch and either move your feet or move your waist, yeah. mm-hmm. then you're out of the way. Yeah. 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 One of the, I remember, I think, uh, going to one of your classes at DCS mm-hmm. a couple of times and it, you said words that were really, um, mm-hmm. important for me, like, and, and how I coach as well. I talk once, once we've gotten through like the footwork and that kind of stuff, mm-hmm. the basics, I talk a lot about weight transfer mm-hmm. and I remember mm-hmm. you going through those concepts and principles with your, it was like a beginner's class or mm-hmm. something. And I was just hearing someone say that I was like, Oh, that's, that's the money that mm-hmm. the idea of being able to transfer your weight, yeah. use the floor underneath you to mm-hmm. generate torque and pressure in the legs that translates through the core into yeah. the arms and that was that was key i love that because otherwise you're arm punching yeah, yeah exactly yeah. exactly you, you see sometimes a lot of kickboxers arm yeah. punch like yeah. that right sometimes you want arm yeah. punch like you want to vary it up but if you yeah. want to sit on your punches mm-hmm. you got to transfer your weight right yeah because that's what gives you the power now yeah. manny what talk to us a little bit about the transition from athlete to coach for you mm. what was that like that experience mm. Don't even really realize it happened because I, I mean, you know, after the Olympics, I sort of, I went to school, I went to university, got a teaching degree. So I was coaching a little bit. And then what sort of brought me back was in 1991, there's this thing called the BC Tough Man Competition. And uh, so I watched it in Vancouver, there was eight cities. And then, so whoever won out of those eight cities in BC would go on to the finals for 10 What was grand. it called? The Tough Man BC, Competition? It's a BC Tough Man Competition. And what was it like a Royal Rumble style? Well, What's going on? Well, Explain this to me. Well, all it was was it was basically boxing, which they said you were allowed to use your elbows. It was kind of, it was before UFC. Open weight class, kind of like early yeah. UFC. Really? Yeah. Go so BC. So then, well, there's two weight classes, like one under 180 and over 180. Big guys yeah. and small guys. So, <laughs> So I watched it in Vancouver and I said, oh, I know I can beat these 180 pounders. And that was at that time, maybe 160. So um, I said, oh, can I go somewhere like Nanaimo or something to qualify? Mm-hmm. And they said, yes, as long as you haven't fought pro, you're allowed to enter. So I entered and, and that was in 1991 and I ended up winning. And, no um, and then I tried to make, go for the 92 Olympic team. But mm-hmm. then they wouldn't let me box because they said, you made money and you're a pro, you can't box. Yeah. So Ugh. got sort of eliminated from that. But so that's why I ended up boxing. Because by this time I had finished my degree in education at UBC and I was sort of substitute teaching. But mm-hmm. then I started boxing again. I started, um, yeah, and then I started boxing pro because Jerry Jago had some shows. I went on his shows and then I started boxing in the U.S. And then eventually I moved to Las Vegas in 1997 mm-hmm. until 2000 and had a go of it and satisfied what I wanted to do and then um, just stepped away. And then in 2004, I started the North Bernie Boxing Club. Mm-hmm. And so I was always coaching a little bit. And I mean, George Angel Mass always allowed me back into the story and then he also what he called it the freezer arms he had the gym of the freezer arms then he, he had then bbc gym and then he helped me start the north Marine box come 2004 oh, so okay. what was that like getting your you know your first class in that mm. in that new role in that space what was that like for no you? i enjoyed it you oh. know because that was part of my life too like i i went into teaching because Originally, I was going to go into maybe get a criminology degree, maybe go into law or something. But in 1988, I met a guy named Dan um, named Dan Steen. He was mm-hmm. a decathlete. 
and his dad's name was Don Steen. So Don was a, ended up being a counselor at Burnaby Central. So mm-hmm. he got introduced to his dad, and his dad kind of said, yeah, why don't you come see me at Burnaby Central? And I went and saw him, and mm-hmm. that was just something I'd, I could do and hmm. helping kids and stuff. And mm-hmm. so then, you know, the credits that I had from Cap College were good. And then I went to Douglas College, did phys ed. So I did phys ed one year. So then I was mm-hmm. able to transfer UBC into third year. And so just things happened. Like, yeah. again, like walking into a, a gym that mm-hmm. I didn't even know was a boxing gym. And I was just going to work out and lift weights. Yeah. You know, Fast forward you just too. try different things, right? Like, if you try different things, you never know what's going to gravitate to you. That's really been my life. And, and so when you, um, when you're fighting professional, mm-hmm. you're also going to school. Well, sir, what happened? <laughs> what happened is I, I wasn't not at the beginning to get my bachelor degree. Cause after you, after the Yay Olympics, I kind of, yeah. I had to decide what I was going to do. So I said, oh, I just, I'll get a degree and then maybe I'll try. I, mm-hmm. It always in the back of my mind, right? But I was yeah. going by the gyms with George and helping George coach a little bit even because mm. you were saying about how to transfer coaching and stuff. So yeah. I was helping mm-hmm. coaching and and I, but, and I was just hanging around, right? Like mm-hmm. a gym rat sort of in a way, but only going maybe once or twice a week depending on how much mm-hmm. stuff I had to do for school. And then, um, that tough man competition came by and I said, Oh, I can make some money to pay some bills and mm-hmm. did that. And then, um, and I wasn't able to box amateurs. So then Gianco had some shows and he said, you can box on this show, that show, that show. And I said, yeah, sure. And then opportunity came in with a guy named Benny Giorgino boxing at a casino down in, the, uh, in Lucky Washington, Eagle. Lucky Eagle. Yeah. And, uh, Benny was really good to me and Benny Giorgino, I got really fortunate was mm-hmm. Benny was, he had world champions like, uh, Guy named Danny Little Red Lopez, Jaime Ayala, I think his name was, or Michael Ayala. And, um, you know, like we were walking through Caesar's Palace one day, and then all I hear is, Benny! <laughs> and who is it? Don King. No. no way. So we had lunch with Don King. Wow. Wicked. And Benny and Don King were really yeah. good friends. Don, because, Don King knows all the matchmakers. Huh? Yeah. yeah. And, I mean, Benny was, he knew a lot of old boxing, that guy. Like mm-hmm. he was, you know, man, he. That guy just, you would have used his job. He would have won. And and yeah. he knew a lot about boxing. He knew a lot of the boxing people. And he was from Riverside, California, and a lot right. of tough Mexicans. And mm. For R- Roberto Garcia's, uh, Robert yeah, Garcia's Robert gym. Garcia's yeah. gym, yeah. And um, but Benny knew everybody in boxing. I got to meet a lot of good people through yeah. Benny. And I got, you know, I was training at the... At the uh, top rank gym because of Benny, mm-hmm. he wow. got took me to Nevada Partners and got me s- set up sort yeah. of in Vegas when I moved to Vegas. And um, but I'm fortunate a lot because even going back, like I used to re- read the Ring magazine, and there's a guy named Hank Kaplan that used to write in the Ring magazine. Mm-hmm. And he also Hank Kaplan was one of the greatest uh, historians of boxing, mm-hmm. and he lived in Florida. And he was Muhammad Ali's agent, like a okay. writing agent or whatever. Like um, he worked with Angelo Dundee and doing all the press releases for Muhammad Ali and stuff. So I remember writing to Hank Kaplan in like 1985 or 86 mm-hmm. about Roberto Duran and he wrote right. me back. Oh, no way. So I became friends with him and I said, mm-hmm. oh, I want to come and train in Miami. Is there any way I, you can help me in Sure enough, in 1987, I went and trained in Miami. I trained at the Fifth Street Gym. Yeah, I was just cool. trained at the yeah. different gyms yeah. there, and I mm. got the spar with Roberto Duran at a place called the Corona. No way. Yeah. Because that was my question. I knew I was about like, Mayweather, what? but I didn't yeah. know about Roberto Duran. No yeah. way. Yeah. Yeah. The hurricane or something. What was that? 1988. Wow. 1988. So, Mother's what were you writing about Duran to. To Hank? To Hank. Nothing, just. I remember there was some sort of article or picture that you had, and how did you get that picture? Oh, wow. Did, who, is he around there? And, and at that time writing it, you had no idea that in a matter yeah, of time you'd be... Oh, wow, yeah. incredible. Crazy. So let's go back to Vegas mm-hmm. in the 70s. Chest hair, shirts down, big crosses, <sighs> yeah. Tom Jones. I wasn't around in the 70s. <laughs> <laughs> I have a lot of questions about your, your Vegas experience. I knew yeah, you trained with uh, Eddie, Futch, Eddie Futch, legendary Eddie trainer, Jim, yeah. Angelo at Dundee. The, well, Angelo was in Miami. Yeah. But um, with Eddie, Eddie was at the, uh, oh, what's his name? Um, uh, Steel. Richard, Richard Steele's Steel. gym yeah. called Nevada Partners, oh, okay. which was near the university. And um, there's so many good trainers there. Like mm-hmm. Jesse Reed trained people out of there. Yeah. Like they had 
they had Eddie Mustafa. Eddie Mustafa trained yeah. out of there. There's two or three boxing rings in that gym. I think there's three wow. three rings in that gym. It was a massive gym, and mm-hmm. um, everyone came through there, man. Yeah, <laughs> and, so cool. was, and then but I made where they trained. Do you have any uh, kind yeah. of stories like like gym wars going on yeah. there? Mm-hmm. No, there wasn't really any gym wars yeah. that I can remember. Like everyone was really respectful of each other, and yeah, yeah there was the odd time like f this, f that, and mm-hmm. Roger Mayweather liked to beak a lot, and, <laughs> yeah. and Roger was like I got to spar with him a few times too because he he I think his last fight may have been in ninety eight or mm-hmm. ninety nine or something like that because yeah. I remember he was boxing and I got to spar with him and and he was sort of like a Tony Pep he could really punch with the right hand and yeah. and. One day I did get to spar with Floyd too. So yeah, I mean, what was that tell like? us about yeah. that. But yeah, I mean, that's what I said. Is that distance? Yeah. It's all mm-hmm. distance. Like it looks like you can hit him, but you can't because yeah. he knows his distance. He knows he can just pull here and he's gone. Yeah. And you know, he developed that over time too. Because if you looked at him in his earlier fights, he was always an aggressor. Whereas near the end, he was saying, "Well, yeah. screw this, I'm not going to get hit." Yeah, he used right? to knock everybody out yeah. when he was pretty boy, right? <clears throat> yeah, when he was one thirty. Yeah, and. um but, you know, he did develop and change because he saw his uncle, I believe that what happened is like he saw his uncle get so bad because of the Parkinson's yeah. syndrome. Right. And then even his dad, senior, he he wasn't all there. The mm-hmm. only guy that was sort of there was Jeff, right? Yeah. Jeff And Jeff never got hit as much. So I'm sure right. Floyd yeah. sort of put all that together and yeah. said, well, shit, man. Mm-hmm. You know, what good is it going to be me if I got millions of dollars and if I yeah. can't talk like yeah, Roger, fair. right? Because I mean, near then, Roger was just sitting in the corner of the gym, just oh, vegetative, man. right? Yeah. yeah, it was bad. Yeah, because you know Floyd was good to him, and he let him stay around the Floyd gym and stuff. Mm-hmm. But yeah, Roxon can be really rough, man, if mm-hmm. you don't take yeah. care of yourself, and and it affects everyone differently. This uh, like uh, C- what are CTE, the CTES, yeah. mm-hmm. chronic traumatic pathology. It affects everyone differently. Like even mm-hmm. in hockey, some hockey players take one or bat, two bad hits and they're done. Some yeah. don't. And and I'm fortunate to be part of a study through the Cleveland Medical Clinic that I've been going down for six. Well, because of COVID, I hadn't gone down for two years, but I did go last year and I'm going again this year oh, in wow. March. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's, a, it's a longitudinal study to find out why it is that some people are affected by concussion and some aren't. Yeah. So they have boxers that obviously, I think the criteria is you've had to had 20 or 25 pro fights. And if that happened, they basically say, okay, if you've had that many pro fights in the gym wars that you've been into and the mm-hmm. boxing matches yeah. you've been into, you got to have Let's suffered some Let's assume that yeah. there's something concussion. Yeah, yeah. worth yeah. measuring. So what kind of tests and studies are they doing? So what they do is they give us an MRI, they give us uh, some testing on like things on a wall and then you got to press buttons right and right different reactionary things they draw blood because they th- they're thinking there might it might be genetically blood. maybe a biomarker that yeah, kind biomarker of indicates that, yeah. whether well okay. that's what they're trying to find out so they yeah. can take blood out of a 10 year old and find out that's interested in playing football and say no football's not wow. for you wow, okay this crazy. is interesting yeah. okay so okay let's 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 fast forward like you you have a, you have a daughter mm-hmm Let's say they did a, a test. They discovered she had a biomarker for something, but she said, "Daddy, I don't want a box." What? How? What would you do? Um, you know, it's tough because you can always try and tell them what to do. You know, I think it's the important thing is just to educate them mm. and let them make their own decision. Mm. You know, and so even if you knew that, you'd say, "Okay, if you want to do it." Yeah. Well, you know what? Um, my wife and her are hard headed, <laughs> so they're gonna do it anyways. So mm-hmm. I might yeah. as well just support them in whatever they want to do. But let. Make sure they understand the repercussions, the, the consequences, yeah. and, and the risk. And, uh, you know, go in with an informed decision. Yeah, because I, I think that's so interesting, right? Like, if yeah. you knew in advance, would it stop you from having those experiences? Like, I, I don't think it would for me either. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. like, boxing, jujitsu, all the things that yeah. I've done in sport. I'm like, I don't think. Well, that's what they asked Muhammad Ali when he was mm-hmm. near. Knowing what you know no, now, yeah. would, would you? you have done it? He said, 100%. Yeah. Yeah. There's no right? way I would have changed anything. Yeah, like look yeah. at the legacy yeah. involved in that decision. I mean, mm-hmm. the it's risk reward though, isn't it? Because you know, yeah, at the exactly. end of the day, when you, when you are that person that's you know really really suffering with it, like, mm-hmm. and how many people are going to be do what Muhammad Ali did, right? Yeah. So, exactly. Exactly. <clears throat> and be able to live off your life with that legacy, and also that's one of the crazy thing about boxing too. Mm-hmm. Like, 
you know, like even when I saw Duran down in Miami, like he didn't really have any money. He was still yeah. fighting because he needed money. There weren't. He was a party animal, though. Yeah, our Roberto. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he was. You know, every time yeah. he went back to the motherland, yeah. it was yeah. like parades yeah. and yeah. strippers and all yeah. sorts. Yeah, and he was spending all the time. Yeah, and, yeah. big old steak dinners. Yeah. But what I learned from that too is that it, it doesn't matter how great you are. People don't. They're not going to pay you after the fact. You're only as mm-hmm. good as your last yeah. match, right? So, right. I don't know. Do you think a lot so of boxers was... struggle with that concept when it ter- when we're kind of talking about the idea of not knowing when to quit? They get caught in like the the relevance and the glory. Oh, in a lot of things because it's their paycheck and mm-hmm. they're riding high. Like I mean, I I never actually fi- or saw it, but I I've read about it and heard about it. And I ran Barkley after he fought, and he'd make whatever two hundred fifty three hundred thousand dollars, which is a lot of money. Yeah. You'd see him at the friggin' uh, table, crap tables, and the yeah. mm-hmm. playing for ten th- ten thousand dollars a hand, twenty thousand dollars a right. hand. That goes quick, yeah, real yeah. quick, right? Especially if you're not very good at crap. That, that yeah. that's the thing too is like a lot of these fighters that have fought an elite level have made a lot of money, but they just don't know how to manage it, mm. you know, and, and invest into things. Yeah. They just spend it all, right? Or they get taken. Yeah. I mean, that too, yeah. look at the corruption. Usain Bolt. I, I just heard, yeah. I read something, yeah, something I read about that. like 14 mm-hmm. million or dollars yeah. or something went missing. Yeah. It's crazy. Or I even, think, yeah. yeah it's, it's can happen to anybody, right? Absolutely. Mm-hmm. I think there's either like, you know, the corruption and the manipulation, or there is yeah. this idea that oftentimes they're, they've come from nothing. Yeah. And all of a sudden you have like enough money to yeah. buy a Bugatti. Like, what are yeah. you doing? Like you yeah. have no, and you're 24 or mm. something. Like you're making bad choices regardless. It's, mm. How important do you think it is that for a boxer to have someone in their, let's say theoretical corner, maybe not their like technical corner mm-hmm. that helps them kind of manage that fame and that money? I think it's very important. I mean, and I think that's what, again, what Floyd had, right? Because his, his uncles went through it and they knew how they'd been taken. So I'm sure mm. they were sort of like... Floyd Sr. is no dummy, you know, yeah. like he's a pretty sharp guy and uh, I'm sure he learned a lot of less. Yeah, like not that, and Floyd's smart enough to figure it out. Yeah. So yeah. You got sure. to learn from their mistakes. I think so. Yeah. I think yeah. so. And that's what makes him and he's very fortunate that way. And, uh, but yeah, I mean, and who, who do you trust really? Like when, when you start getting that day, kind of yeah, coin yeah. too, yeah. right? And people yeah. are coming around and who do you trust? I, yeah. I don't know. I mean, it's, it's very, um, because people come out of the wood and yeah, it's really sure. hard. To for sure. Figure out. Yeah. yeah. No, I'm your second yeah. cousin. I swear to yeah. God. You yeah. remember me? <laughs> yeah. Let's get them. They all want to join the entourage, <laughs> yeah. you know, and just yeah. be a part of the, the whole buzz. Right. Mm-hmm. And then when the buzz is gone, they're, then yeah. they're gone. Then they're gone. Yeah. Yeah. Manny, did you ever, uh, did you ever personally struggle with kind of like moving out of pro, you know, sort of leaving that life behind the identity around it? Did that ever be something that you, you struggled with? No, it didn't, didn't affect me because, well, maybe it did, but I always, I always had something to go to. And I mean, I, I'm very fortunate that I had that degree. And while I was in Vegas, believe it or not, I did a master's degree at UNLV in counseling. And so uh-huh. even when I finished and I came back to Vancouver and, you know, I started looking for work in the mm-hmm. teaching field, more mm-hmm. counseling wise. And I was able to find some work that I liked and, and, um, I was very fortunate. Right. Yeah. And, but you didn't put that, all your eggs in that no, basket. No. And then some people do and it works. Some people don't, but even if it does work, what are you going to do when you're done? Like mm-hmm. you got to have something yeah. that, that stimulates your brain somehow or because sure. even when you're done doing what you're great at, mm-hmm. you're not going to be able to do it all your life. Yeah. yeah. And unless you're Warren Buffett and he's like 90 years old or whatever, he's still <laughs> investing. But yeah. I, yeah. Or like even Michael Buffer. Like if you just, yeah. Have, yeah. I mean, yeah. Bruce Buffer, Michael Buffer. Yeah. He's my hero. Yeah. 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 But I heard he's got, Something wrong with his throat. Oh, Michael no. yeah, I, I think he had some type of cancer. Uh, yeah. What? Yeah. yeah. Like before. And oh, uh, they got rid of it. Oh, wow. Okay. And here he is yeah. still, still yeah. doing it with a bow tie. Oh, yeah. Fantastic. And that's an incredible story too, because the story I heard, and I did, I took a promoter course that they had, and uh, I forget the guy's name. It was a promoter in California that was doing it. And anyway, he invited me down, and then I got to do this thing, and then he had Michael, or yeah, Michael Buffer is a guest, and he told us the story about how him and his kid were sitting, listening to boxing, and then they said, okay, 
and he was in Vegas, and they're going to have a competition about who can be the best ring announcer, and he joined that competition, and he won. No way. By wow. doing Let's I Get Ready Rumble. I didn't know that, did you? No, I had no idea. Yeah, Crazy. he just went in there, and he had, Let's yeah. Get Ready to Rumble. So the, les- <laughs> the lesson I'm taking away from today wow. is we just all need to move to Vegas. And yeah. then- or you just never know Land what's going to happen. Yeah. You just never know what's going to happen unless you yeah. try things. Yeah. yeah. And that's... Had Michael Buffer not tried that, then he would never have been Michael Buffer that he is of today. Real, and then had had Michael Buffer not been Michael Buffer, then Bruce Buffer would have never yeah. found Michael Buffer. That's right. Yeah. Oh my God, Isn't that crazy. crazy. That's yeah. so wild. The right? world changes, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. Manny, I have a question for you. Kind mm-hmm. of about, I think it's really cool, and that you're also a teacher. Mm-hmm. How important is having teaching as a as a tool and as a background when it comes to coaching? Because sometimes mm-hmm. I, I I see that. Coaches aren't necessarily great teachers. Mm-hmm. And I, I do believe there's a difference. Yeah. Well, I think one of the things that teaching has taught me is that everyone learns differently, mm-hmm. right? Because mm-hmm. you can teach a kid how to subtract, how to add, but one kid will understand one way, another kid. So I think that's an important aspect that not everyone's going to do the job the same. And I, at the beginning, I try to teach everyone to turn it over and make sure your chin's stuck. But then as you progress, if they do it a little differently, well, that's their way. And they're hmm. going to figure out if they're going to get caught. If it right works or not, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, and they might adjust to make it work. So then that's yeah. coming from themselves. So they're fixing it. But you just tell them, but I think what Dan was saying is to have the balance to mm-hmm. start with. And if mm-hmm. you can have those basic structures, then they're going to be able to develop themselves, hmm. right? Yeah. Right. What do you think the hallmark qualities of a good coach are? I think that's pretty much it. Like, I mean, I turned with Angelo Dundee and like, he can break things down. Like I remember he told me the man, man, it's just, it's the, it's the pie theory of boxing. It's, you just (laughs) think there's a piece of pie in front of you. And, um, and you, but if there's a pie in front of you, there's a pie in front of your opponent. Right. So Mm -hmm. if you're standing in your opponent's pie, yeah, you're going to get hit. Mm Mm-hmm. So get out of that pie. Yeah. And then I sort of visualize it from above, like he says, mm. and then mm. that's what lateral movement does. It gets you mm. out of the pie or it's, you move back, but if you move back, it's easier yeah. to get hit. Interesting. It's funny mm. you say that because mm. I, was, I was watching some of your fights last night mm. and uh, I like your approach, you know, like mm. it's very methodical mm. and you incorporate the body work a lot too. Mm. And then you always step off after, Simple. you know, just simple so stuff. Simple. And a lot of fighters don't do that. No, and, simple. you know, they admire their punches. They stay in the pie, like you mm-hmm. said, and yeah. and then they get hit, you know, mm-hmm. and then, then it's just a war after because mm-hmm. it's just back and forth, right? Mm-hmm. And I think in order to get good at boxing, you, you have to you have to do what you're good at doing. And, mm-hmm. and I, mm-hmm. I didn't have the most power. I wasn't the fastest, but by getting out of the way after you punch, you have yeah. an advantage because your opponent has to has to adjust themselves, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. I was fortunate in a lot of ways and I was very, I worked hard. Like, I mean, there's nothing you can do, be good at or do mm-hmm. well at unless you're going to work hard. Like I, I got up in the morning to run mm-hmm. and I learned that very early in my boxing life too is because my first match I lost mm-hmm. and I just boxed the bigger guy. So yeah. that came back about 20 matches later. I got to rematch him and beat him. Right. <laughs> but what I learned in my third match was that I beat a kid from Maple Ridge. Mm-hmm. And then I had a rematch with him in my fourth match. And I said, well, I beat him in my third match. I'm, I beat him, you know, just a month or two ago. Yeah. I'm going to beat his ass Surely, again, yeah. right? But then I didn't run as much. And mm-hmm. I might have missed a couple boxing things. And I got beat. Yeah, mm-hmm. very important lesson to learn because unless you're at your best, you're not going to do your best. And that's mm-hmm. something so important that I think a lot of boxers need to remember is mm-hmm. that hard work will beat talent. You know, mm-hmm. and it does. a lot of fighters that have talent, you know, they they go in the gym and and they can you know neutralize the guy mm-hmm. and this and that. But when it comes to an actual fight mm-hmm. and somebody's trained really hard and you haven't really put in that work. It's going to show, you know, the, mm-hmm. the ring always shows the truth, right? Yeah, so, the ultimate equalizer. Yeah, playing all hard combat is, sport. Key, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah, fitness and the right fitness is very important. You got to have mm-hmm. the aerobic as well as the anaerobic, be yeah. able to explode, and be able to recuperate. Yeah, on and off, on and off, on Purposeful and off. Purposeful training right? creates yeah. results, yeah. not yeah. just more, 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 more as well. Yeah. So yeah. being able to understand that balance. Yeah. And the more I think about boxing, it's the coach can only do so much. You, mm-hmm. you have to; it has to come from within the boxer, right? Because mm-hmm. if yeah. 
Heart. A lot of the, it's heart and a lot of it's just being able to. Like discipline, right? And be disciplined to do your own running, yeah. to do mm-hmm. your own, push yourself to, to the limits. And also to be able to decipher in your mind, okay, this isn't working. I better do this mm-hmm. or, and be able to do it rather quickly. Yeah. And um, if you can't do it, it's not going to work. <laughs> like yeah. it's yeah. just simple, right? And and not to be so hard on yourself that, okay, it didn't work this time. I'm going to be able to adjust it and do it next time and, mm-hmm. and have that confidence in yourself that you can yeah. get better. And uh, yeah, like I said, like, yeah. So out of my first four matches, I lost two. I was 50%, right? And then after that, I learned the big lesson that I got to be in shape and run and run harder yeah. than the other person. And when I'm running, I'm thinking, well, they're doing the same as I want to push myself even harder and <laughs> run yeah. hills. So yeah. I started running hills, not knowing mm-hmm. that it's more anaerobic and just doing things. Yeah. And, uh, and um, yeah, can't complain. I was very fortunate. You know, I had a great mom that cooked well for me, so I was always yes, well fed mom. and stuff. Fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Shout out to the moms. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All the moms out there yeah. cooking all the meals. Very <laughs> important. Well, Muhammad Ali talks about his mom a lot, how yeah. good she was to him. And, yeah, absolutely. And she brought him to, apparently she brought him to a lot of the training camps to do the cooking. Oh, yeah. no way. Apparently, wow. that's what I heard. My yeah. kid. Mm-hmm. Um, Manny, who are you working with right now that you're excited about? Um, I'm working with a lot of kids, you know, like mm-hmm. a lot of young kids, like a uh, kid that came with me today, Sebastian. And, Shout uh, out Sebastian. He's just sitting out hanging mm-hmm. out. Yeah. Got some you good know, nods from yeah. Sebastian too. Some nuggets from coach. He's yeah. like, yes. So, you know, I mean, I think every kid's important and, you know, my, I'm going through some transitions too. Like, you know, I was coaching like Robert Cousins, who I mm-hmm. coached from. He was nine years old. It yeah. was, a, I believe, one of my... Like it wasn't me. Like Robert had so much ability too, right? But you know, just by giving him the right mm-hmm. shout out, Robert, s- Robert, yeah. and some some things. He has a Manny style, right? Yeah, like when you see him fight, sort of, you, yeah. you can very see much that. so. And so you don't want to make someone what they're not, because yeah. had Angelo Dundee done that, mm-hmm. Muhammad Ali wouldn't have been who Muhammad Ali is. But mm-hmm. Muhammad Ali wouldn't have stuck around with Angelo Dundee. Mm-hmm. He would have been with another dream. Yeah. That's, right. Um, sure. And, you know, like all these guys, like Eddie Futch and like all those, like they're, I don't know, even kept forgetting their names, but all these great trainers, like uh, Freddie Roach, mm-hmm. like all these guys, like they're all sort of teaching the same thing. But if they were teaching the same thing to the great talents that come to their gyms, they yeah. would all be world champions and yeah. this and that, but yeah. they're not. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Because a lot of it has to come from the individual. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the coach can't transfer that to the individual unless they really want it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, they got to figure it out. They got to watch video. Like I, you know, when I started watching VHS, like I would rewind, watch, rewind, watch, rewind, watch. And I had pretty much all of Roberto's matches. And I, that's the style that I wanted to be. Like when you watch the run, you think he's just punching, but half the time he's fainting. Yeah. He's positioning his feet. He's moving around. He steps around. He punches with his right hand and he gets mm-hmm. off to the angle. Like, mm-hmm. but you got to go slow. You got to slow mo it and you got to yeah. watch it over and over again to watch what he does. Cause when he was younger, he was so fast. Studying that on so VHS quick. must have taken yeah. forever. <laughs> it took forever. Have you seen the video where he's sparring uh, Connor Ben, uh, senior? Mm-hmm. He's just like, Playing with him, like, yeah. wow. just like making him look like nothing. No, I think I probably saw that. Yeah, because yeah. Connor Ben is so slow. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, he's like yeah. you know he's loading mm-hmm. up on his mm-hmm. shots and everything, and yeah. and he's just making him look Durant, foolish. Yeah, and Duran knows what's happening yeah. before it happens. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because that's what's great about a great fighter is that they do things that make their opponent do mm-hmm. certain things, and that's yep. what makes Floyd really yep. great too. Is he'll do things to. And he knows what his opponent's going to do, it's so like he's ready to go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. manipulate what's going to happen. And then yeah. if it doesn't happen, then no big deal. I'm out. Mm-hmm. But he's he knows when they're going to throw the right hand because he's given them a little bit of an angle yeah. that they can throw the right hand. So he's waiting for that right hand and yeah. cutting it or whatever. and Setting a trap. Mm-hmm. Yeah, setting traps. And and, and and such a chess match. That's why yeah. Lennox Lewis yeah. likes to play chess so much. Yeah. yeah. Simple. That's the thing. Um, it is like mm. a chess match, mm. you know, and like got to think ahead. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. like you got to think, and it mm. uh, it just gets deeper and deeper. And that's the thing I love about boxing. You know, the sweet science is yeah. the, on that elite level. It's mm. such a chess match. 
And mm-hmm. to the casual fan, it might be mm-hmm. kind of boring at times. Mm-hmm. But it's funny. I was literally just thinking that. I've heard yeah. someone say that before. Mm-hmm. And, and I think like, in my opinion, I always thought the casual fan was probably just like either, you know, gladiator style, like yeah. y- yelling at the carnage <laughs> kind of thing. And then it gets more exciting as you understand the nuances yeah. of boxing mm-hmm. and when For you sure. can read the situation. What's what? It's like anything. It's like jujitsu. Like I didn't mm-hmm. like jujitsu at first. super nuanced. But now yeah. that, you know, I understand it more. Yeah. I actually like watching it because... Because you see people's vulnerabilities, mm-hmm. like when they're in certain positions and things like that. So yeah, when you see what works and what doesn't, yeah. And, and there's and when you understand it too, there's yeah. glaring mistakes. Mm-hmm. Like you right. can see the mistakes glaring yeah. at you when they've yeah. happened and the consequences yeah. of those mistakes. Right. So yeah. yeah, so I always thought, you know, I was like, oh, surely boxing for someone who just doesn't know it's got to be mm-hmm. exciting because it's mm-hmm. like our human draw to like yeah. you know blood and combat and all that mm. kind of like primal stuff but and maybe that, i don't know maybe it is boring to the obvious like the you know average person i don't know but boxing has been around for so many years because of her for a reason and that's mm. the reason right because it's yeah. the human human nature wants to yeah. see it right and there's yeah. nothing like it when you're when you're at a big huge fight doesn't even matter if it's in vegas yeah. or yeah. in timbuktu like <laughs> yeah. it's just a good it's, fight is a yeah, good fight, yeah yeah exactly you know? and people are yeah. freaking just Takes everything away from them and yeah. they're just in a different yeah, and half world. Half of them right? are looking at these two people like, yeah. how are they doing this? Yeah. I could never step in yeah. there. Like this just this out of yeah. body of like, yeah. you mm-hmm. know, just absolute adm- admiration at the courage I think that it like takes when, for two people to step between yeah. the ropes. Like when Arturo Gotti and Mickey Ward. Oh, oh my god, my favorite yeah. that yeah. trilogy was crazy. On that note, Gotti had so many wars though, like oh. like with so many good fighters, like Ivan Robinson. You could like go down that like, YouTube yeah, rabbit hole like, for. I know every it's every fight was like know. crazy. You know? Yeah, he had that style. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So Manny, if you could fight anyone from history, yeah. like let's say pro boxer history, who would you want to fight? Box. Um, you know, I've often think about like a Sugar Ray Robinson, right? Because mm. like he went from welterweight to middleweight and. I mean, he was so amazing in the way he mm-hmm. the angles that he'd throw punches at, and he was nonstop. And yeah, um, yeah, I'd, I would just be. I'd like to the go goat. back in time and going yeah. after the goat. Well, <laughs> yeah, possibly, but you often think too, like the guys of today, like the Sugary Leonard's, like mm-hmm. he was so explosive mm. and fast oh, and wiry. powerful, yeah. and yeah. would a Sugary Robinson would would he have been able to keep up to a Sugar Ray Leonard? Like, it's kind of, mm-hmm. I sort of wonder that sometimes. Yeah. And that's why I would like to go back into time to see, because they didn't have the training techniques that they sort of have today. What I'm talking right. about yeah. is, like, the explosive training, the anaerobic training, the yeah. plyometrics and stuff. They mm-hmm. didn't do it back then. Yeah. So mm-hmm. what would be the difference, right? How cool mm-hmm. would, like, if AI you could simulate and, like, pick... A boxer, and it would simulate. Yeah. Well, a, they've a tried fight doing from, that. Have they really? <laughs> well, not, this isn't a well my brilliant idea. Well, <laughs> oh. they've done those, like the Rocky mm-hmm. Marciano against Muhammad Ali, and some people have said, "Oh, Marciano would have like I don't." Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's no way Marciano would have cool Muhammad Ali. If you could watch that. Yeah, but it's only someone. It's whoever puts the input in. Yeah. We'll get the result. Well, you know I wonder. I it's wonder like, if it's like you... subjective to a certain yeah. point, you know. Yeah, because even wonder. a computer, someone yeah. has to feed that computer that info. Right. Exactly. But this new stuff that I hear about is going to affect education. I forget what it's called, but you can just get someone to write an a, uh, an essay for you, like on whatever, oh, like history God. or whatever, and they can spit out a in three seconds. Right. Yeah. You just input the information that it needs to have, and then it spits it out, and apparently it's. These essays are as good as some scholars write. Wow. But that's what's amazing wow. about this world. Like who's yeah. to know what it's gonna be like? Like is that know. gonna is that gonna put humans in a back like back them up because we're our brains might not be able mm-hmm. to work as quick as a computer can and take all yeah. that information and and and, and, like and figure it out, and process and, it all. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Some stuff comes out and I'm just like, man, the future terrifying yeah. like it's i'm like scary. i don't know if i belong there like yeah. i i don't know even from the 90s to now right? like yeah. it's huge i guess i guess we're that old hey yeah. we, we're, we're all <laughs> dating ourselves hard people right? are like oh, the yeah. 90s that Remember was so MySpace? long ago <laughs> yeah i know <laughs> i was like that MySpace. was pretty cutting edge mm-hmm. for me yeah it's it's crazy but I, I i just i do think it would be so cool if you could throw in like you know, like let's say you take Sugar Ray uh, yeah, Robinson. Yeah, and you and you were mm-hmm. able to input all of his fights so that yeah, the, the yeah. AI could, could map out his movement patterns yeah. and blah blah blah. And then you do that with Sugar Ray Leonard, yeah. map out all his movement patterns, and you watch that virtual fight. Like, how cool would that be, though? 
the thing is, you, yeah. you, you can't, um, you know, the chess match part of it. You can't. You would be missing the, yeah. the, the true, like, for especially for boxing yeah. fans, yeah. you'd be missing a little you don't know what moves it, they would actually exactly. make in that moment. Yeah. And, you know? the, and the way I say that is because Marvin Hagler and Thomas Hearns, you didn't put their information. Yeah. But who was to know that Marvelous Marvel would be able to take the right hands oh, that Hearns man. hit him with? Yeah. Mm-hmm. AI would have said, no, those right hands. Yeah, exactly. They're going to topple anybody. Right. But they didn't topple Marvel. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Marvelous um, Mormon, like that yeah. was those fights amazing. were amazing. Fight. That was yeah. some of my those yeah. are some of my favorite to watch. Yeah. So you'd fight Sugar Ray Robinson as well, you were. Yeah, I would like to like I often thought of that. Yeah, like mm-hmm. you know, see what would happen. Like, yeah. I mean, I mean, like he was amazing and great, but it would have been great yeah. to be able to step in and try to get better by yeah. getting seeing what the best would do to you. you know? Absolutely, yeah, it would be great. So you said you're you're going through some you know transitions. What what's oh. next for Manny? The night, I'm pretty. I'm such a simple person that I just want to cruise. And I, I was very fortunate, like I said, and you know got got my education. And, you know, like in terms of my personal life, like I was married. Unfortunately, it didn't work out. And, and you have a you have a kid, right? I have you a child, yeah, yeah, but not from my ex-wife, like. That's one of the problems in my life. Uh, you know, like, I think, you know, boxing obviously affects people. And I think I, I have a bit of a trigger in a way, too. Like, sometimes I'm pr- pretty much always pretty low. But sometimes I snap. So mm. if you're with someone 24-7 or most of the time, then mm-hmm. obviously maybe I wasn't. Like, I'm not a violent person, but I'll just snap. Verbally, right? Yeah. yeah. I think that's so, half human nature. Yeah. yeah maybe. The person my, that you are around the I think I got the, the same thing as you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm by so, myself, I'm, so I yell at the wall yeah, a lot. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So who knows? I don't mm. know. Maybe that's what happened with X. But then I, yeah. So, yeah, I was fortunate to have a child, and I nice. love the little guy. He's, mm-hmm. he's He lives How old in Nino. He's 13. Oh. Lives, Boxing? No, he's plays soccer. And okay. Nice. He lives in England, though, because his mom went to England, and... So right. I couldn't really stop that. And uh, she's remarried to a British guy, British guy, and they're in England in a place called Cheshire. Cheshire, yeah. Okay. And yeah. so he's playing soccer, and I he comes to see me at Christmas and at summertime. And he's only been gone for a year, so mm-hmm. I get oh, okay. to see him in a few months. And mm-hmm. in August, he's coming. So, you know, he's just about as tall as me now, and he's only wow. 13, and uh, he's a great kid, and, uh, you know cherish that yeah mm-hmm. and, uh, but you know whatever he wants to do it's up to him like daniel's saying mm-hmm. you know you can't force someone to do something yeah, if they exactly. want it you know you can sort of just encourage expose mm-hmm. them to things expose them and to, then, yeah. Yeah, he's been to the decide. gym a lot and he's uh do you know do you notice any natural ability oh, that he has in it oh well, he knows how to you know sort of turn his body like right. shift the weight and stuff yeah. so yeah. he knows how to do that and I think that made him like he played a bit of baseball before he mm-hmm. left and stuff, and he was actually pretty good at at hitting the ball. He cracked them pretty good. Awesome. Yeah. So it's the same sort of motion, mm-hmm. so right? I think yeah. That he got that from just being three, four years old and being at the gym and just watching and punching yeah. and using his whole body to punch rather than just the arms. And yeah. You no, know, when it's your own kid, it's so different though. You mm-hmm. just it's yeah. the love there that's amazing, and you know, think about him lots, talk to him a lot, son. Uh, What's that app that I what's use? That? Not WhatsApp. I mm. use um, what's it called? Uh, it is called Snapchat. Snapchat. Oh yeah. Wow. Making video. Yeah. I don't even have Snapchat. No. Nice one, man. <laughs> well, I didn't either until he told me to get onto. You're the it, last so. person I thought would be using Snapchat. <laughs> that's only because I can get, I you know now you know you can get a video on it. Yeah, yeah it's no, great. That's true. It's amazing. You yeah. definitely can. So. Um, no, That's fantastic. why I know about Snapchat and uh mm-hmm. oh, really what's whatever it takes whatever whatever the wind takes and you know, I'm just I want to be comfortable. I don't want to have any problems. I I mean Yeah. Simple. Simple yeah. life is the best life and stress is shit, amazing. man. Stress, stress is, is bad. Shit. So, just like boxing, you yeah. know, like you start off with balance. It's yeah. like life, you have to have yeah. balance, right? Yeah. And I try to remind myself mm-hmm. that a lot. Right? Have balance. Yeah. yeah. Most important thing. For anyone, I think, mm-hmm. and um, I mean, you even look at real wealthy people like I um, talk about um, 
It's like I mentioned before. Now my mind sees sometimes uh, the the billionaire investment. Warren guy. Buffett. Buffett, yeah. Buffett, yeah. right. Like Buffett, like he lives such a simple life. Apparently, he's got the same career he had twenty yeah. years ago. And <laughs> That's stuff. so like, cool. Yeah. So simple, That's right? So cool. Like he's got that. no one to impress. It. He's yeah. got nothing, nothing to prove. prove. He's, nothing he's prove. on a different level, yeah. boss, yeah. where he doesn't even yeah. have to like show off. Yeah. You know? yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. That's what I mean. Like I yeah. sort of look through people like that and say, right. well. Mm-hmm. Driving a Corolla, but yeah. mad <laughs> zeros cares? in the bank yeah. account. Yeah, yeah. 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 And that's the way sort of I try to live too. Is yeah. I don't, I don't want to friggin, mm-hmm. I don't want to have, I don't want to portray something that I can't prove. Yeah, or that I can't. Did boxing teach you that lesson? No. Did boxing teach me like? Yeah. Or did it solidify like, that idea? Like, possibly. like to stay humble, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. You gotta yeah. stay humble because you never know. Like you get, you know, you sparring with someone. Can't that underestimate yeah. Yeah, and life. Yeah, and then you get yeah. clocked, yeah. or you yeah. never know, right? And you're just so you're just a human being like anybody else, really. Mm-hmm. And your your blood is red. It's no different than anyone else's, mm-hmm. right? And yeah. I think boxing does sort of teach you that, to tell yeah. you the truth, because yeah. you know, on any given day, you can get your ass okay. handed to you, yeah. and, and Floyd did too. Yeah, mm-hmm. sparring against the. Uh, a, a southpaw, tall southpaw that was a world champion. Uh, chop Chop Corley? Or no, a not Chop Corley. Corley really... hurt him, though, in yeah. the fight. Yeah. yeah. Mm. But this guy was sparring with him at the gym. Mm. And what was his name? Paul, Paul Williams. Magli- Paul... Paul Williams? No, not Paul oh. Williams. No, Paul... Yeah. Paul. There's another. He was a fe- lightweight champion of the world, Paul. Spatafor. Spatafor. Yeah. Wow, there you go. Yeah. You go. Good. Yeah. There you go. Spat of four yeah. was good, man. Yeah, yeah. And there was video yeah. on it too. Like yeah. I wasn't at the wow. gym, but it was around the same time that he, I was he down went there. to jail or something, like yeah, like for yeah. murder or something. Yeah, he yeah. shot someone at a guy. Wow. His wife yeah. or his girlfriend at the gas station. He's, yeah. you know, like he never really took that many punches either. But he's mm-hmm. got to be something wrong with him. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Or it could have just been the way he grew up, or who you never yeah. know. Who knows? Right? There's so many. There's factors, many factors oh, yeah. I that think. can affect yeah. to certain people, right? Yeah. yeah. So many. Um, you know, one thing that I really like and respect about yeah. you is you're like the jack of all trades. You know, yeah. you know all the different angles of the boxing business as a fighter, as a promoter, as mm-hmm. a cut man, you know, like podcast host. A <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> little bit, yeah. Yeah. So what, like, you know, like one thing that I have a tough time with um, from the promoter angle is uh, the perception because I, I feel like promoters kind of get grouped into this like, Don King kind of yeah. stigma, right? Some and and it's understandable to a degree because mm-hmm. you hear about these stories all the mm-hmm. times of fighters getting taken advantage of. Yeah. Um, but it's hard to to escape that. You know, yeah. everybody thinks that you're just living this crazy life, making all this money and stuff. But Good luck. the reality of the boxing <laughs> right. business mm-hmm. is so tough, right? And um, you as a promoter, like, mm-hmm. how did you find it? Uh, when you're promoting, it was like that. Like I mean, I was just doing it on the side of the side of my desk, sort of thing. Yeah. So I was teaching and coaching and doing different things, but it was very difficult because you know you get you got nine, eight matches, six matches, let's say, mm-hmm. but every single athlete is like a team. So you got like 12 or 16 teams, yeah, hockey teams to, to take with. care of. Yeah. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And you're taking care of that and it's so difficult to do. Right. And then mm-hmm. you don't, you're not like at a Bob Arum stage where you got, you know, TV contracts where you can yeah. pay other people to do the job that you have to do, which yeah. is matchmaking and make sure that's running well and everything. And yeah. You got so many other jobs you got to do. It's very hard to do it all, right? Mm-hmm. And um, it's it's one of those things. And then to get the people to come out to 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 support the shows, that's another thing. You got to yeah. do so mm-hmm. many things. There's so yeah. many things that you're playing with. And so much risk, and you know, like, huge risk. Like, if like you don't have a secure, yeah. like, you know. I mean, we were doing it at the River Rock, but the River mm. Rock wasn't giving us a site fee or nothing, which they may, sh- well, could yeah. have when it was early in the day, but mm. they were giving us a decent deal on it and stuff. Mm. But even then, I'm sure it yeah, was still very it was challenging. Tough to, it was challenging yeah. to to make a to make it break even, even right? Yeah. Because you know, as soon as one of the boxers starts doing well, then they think they're the, mm. they got it, <laughs> they got it all. So you got to start yeah. paying, but. 
It doesn't work that way because you can go anywhere else in the world. They're not going to give you a penny. They're going to exactly. use you as an opponent, yeah. but you won't. Yeah. That, that, you that's know? a thing that, um, you know, somebody kind of taught me when I was getting into the professional side. Mm -hmm. And they just always talked about, you know, like it's like an ocean full of sharks. And I was like, you know, I was like, no, nah, it's not going to be that mm -hmm. hard. I just slap fights together. But mm -hmm. you learn that, you know, everybody has their own motives. Mm -hmm. And it's very hard because you're dealing with so many different personalities. Yeah. And, um, you know, and, and I think that's one of the reasons why there isn't professional boxing here consistently because mm -hmm. of, of all the challenges that you face, the obstacles, mm -hmm. the personalities, people like other promoters, like everybody trying to get a piece of what you're yeah. doing or they're jealous of what you're doing and they're trying to squash it before it ever no, takes off. You know, so it's just um, instead of actually supporting each other, I, I feel like there's a lot of like hater mentality out there, you know? Yeah, everyone's trying to everyone's trying to cut everyone else down it's yeah. a simple thing but and then you end up with nothing yeah, you, know? you end up with yeah. nothing and that's historically how it's been i mean mm -hmm. um you know in 1983 a guy named butch lewis came to vancouver to do a show and brought michael spinks he was michael spinks promoter michael spinks fought a guy named oscar river denera at the pacific coliseum and i think it was 1983 or 82 and um, but he came that once because they were thinking, oh yeah, Oscar can... Bonavena. No, Oscar Riva. De oh, okay, a different. Yeah, Oscar Bonavena yeah. was the heavyweight that fought Muhammad Ali. But this guy was from Peru, I believe. Oh, okay, South America. But, yeah. Um, Michael Spinks won. I think he stopped him in the eleventh round. But again, Michael Spinks trained at the Inner City Gym, and I got to meet Michael wow, Spinks. So crazy, man. I was very fortunate, like I said, and. Um, but in terms of promoting, everyone thinks it's so easy. Oh, if he can do it, I can do. it. And mm -hmm. they try to do this or that, and they screw They're everything one and up. Done, you yeah, know, like yeah. A lot of they, times. But the problem is that they screw everything up, and then they think yeah. they they pawn that off on on Dan. Well, Dan screwed it up. Mm -hmm. was, yeah, nothing to do with that. It was mm -hmm. it was that other show. So then they, yeah. they they say I'm not going to another boxing show because the last one I went to was goddamn horrible. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. but that had nothing to do with it. Well, yeah, yeah but it doesn't matter because I'm not going to even, I'm not even, I'm not going to, you know, they're not going to pay 50 mm -hmm. bucks to go see something that mm -hmm. the last time they went was useless and terrible mm -hmm. and yeah, all the exactly. fights, none of them happened that were supposed to happen and there's 20 minutes, 30 minutes in between every match. Mm -hmm. And I was waiting. There, there was more intermission than there was boxing. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. You know, that's the problem, part yeah. of the problem, right? Because mm -hmm. like you said, there's people that will come in and say, well, if he can do it, I can do it. But they don't realize the, the, the intricacies that come into it. So yeah. then they screw up the big show. So then it's another year or two before anyone else will go back to boxing. And yeah. if yeah. the person that was doing the shows, it automatically rubs off on them. Absolutely. Because it trickles down to everybody exactly. else. Yeah. Yeah, there's so many, so many variables, you yeah. know, like, and, and everything has to be, Perfect, almost, you know, yeah. for yeah. for it to, to go uh, through. Well, it's not just the boxing; it's the it's knowing entertainment, yeah. the yeah. entertainment side of it, exactly. so orchestrating yeah. the entire experience yeah. from the way it looks, the, music, the way it smells, the way everything. it feels. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And and even coming down to the fights, you know, because yeah. I find in Canada we're so used to seeing this A side versus B side, mm -hmm. you know, beat down where yeah. you know the outcome before you even watch it. That's you right. know, so mm. one thing I'm trying to do here is really. Um, Make good you know, fights. our team, yeah. what we're yeah. trying to do here is make good fights, 50, 50 fights, yeah. right? Or close to that, yeah. right? And, yeah. and and then you get better, you develop. Exactly. Right? And that's what Benny Giorgino did at the Lucky mm -hmm. Eagle. It was a simple little place, but guys like Lupe Aquino, former world champion, fought there. Uh, Michael Dokes fought there. He had those old guys, but then he put them in tough too, right? So they yeah. had to really fight. And, yeah. And, like uh, not every fight has to be no, tough. No, it doesn't. But, mm -hmm. But you yeah. want to have someone there that can actually hold their own. You yeah. don't want to have someone that's just going to just fall over. Lay right? down, yeah. yeah. So yeah. it makes it very difficult, though, because, like, that's what I see is it happens is if you do it, then everyone else says, well, that's easy. I can do yeah. that, what he does. And then they mess it up, and then it reflects bad on the person that mm -hmm. was building it up, right? Yeah. And, yeah. But you can't. We live in a democratic society, so whatever people want to do, they got to do. But it's yeah. unfortunate that people... Yeah, aren't able to understand that. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, that's not their. That's not that show. But the problem with that is there's only so many boxing fans, and yeah. they're sort of hungry yeah. for it sometimes. Yeah. That, so. That's the other big yeah. uh, issue. You know, like with BC, I find mm -hmm. is the infrastructure. Like, I feel like um, whoever the promoter is, mm -hmm. they have to like not only 
promote the show and do all that, but mm-hmm. they have to get the commission on board, media support. Yeah. You know, like Very like different. I don't know why in BC they kind of look at it like with Second this hand. like yeah, mm-hmm. like you're a criminal or something <laughs> if you do professional boxing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it it's does. um to get the support is very difficult. Yeah, yeah, yeah it is. Yeah. yeah. But once you get something that's good, everyone's going to want to love it. Mm. That's true. And then I think what happens, I think that and this is what I try to do with the river rock is you got to build the, you got to build something that people want. But then you always run into the problem that that thing that you're building is going to. S- bail out you know what yeah, i'm saying you gotta have exactly. sort of lock up but then you don't yeah. want to lock them up for 10 years because they think yeah. you're the criminal that's gonna take their life yeah. so yeah, yeah. such a fine balance it, you know? it's like a double-edged sword because when you also yeah. when you lock them down yeah. like their fights become more expensive right and they get into the eight round 10 know, round know. you know and, and then titles come and you gotta pay sanctioning for fees to come in and stuff yeah and all that kind of stuff it's so difficult. it's like becomes a bill at the same time right yeah somehow you got to make it enticing to for them, and mm-hmm. uh, somehow you got to. Yeah, it's it's not an easy thing, and boxing is a difficult thing because, as you know, like with all these fights that you see about Tank Davis, Ray Ryan, Ryan yeah. Uh, yeah. Garcia, and yeah. everything, like sometimes they come through, but a lot of times they don't. Yeah, like mm-hmm. Spence Crawford. Yeah, you when's know, that going to yeah. happen? Oh, because they're two separating things at yeah. a yeah. much higher altitude, but mm-hmm. similar to what's going on right here, right? Yeah. yeah. I think the ultimate goal is, you know, just get it. At first, when you start something, it's like, mm-hmm. you know, people won't pick up your phone, the, you know, the phone mm-hmm. when you call. Yeah. yeah. And eventually they're calling you, yeah. you know, and that, yeah. that's, that's, I think the place if you, you have that, get to. if you have that, then result you want is you want competitive matches. If you have that, it's exactly. going to, people are going to yeah. want to come out and yeah. support it, right? Yeah. 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 There's a, like excitement and, yeah. and the production level too, right? Yeah. The, like yeah. if you mesh those two, yeah. Uh, yeah. It's going to work. Yeah. Because it's entertainment, like you yeah. said. Yeah. Speaking of, we've got a show coming up. March 25th. Yep. At? Grand Valley Casino, yep. Burnaby. Great. That'll be our, our last one there for a minute. Yeah. But I know, really I know we keep that. saying that, but <laughs> it's hard to get the right venue, you know. Especially like, when you end up getting real comfortable with a room. Like, yeah. you, you, yeah. you know the feel, you know the flow. Yeah. 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 But we're really looking forward to that. And uh, it was also such a pleasure to have you on the show. And yeah, I mean, what a what a wealth of of knowledge mm-hmm. and experience and great stories. Could talk to you all day. And yeah, absolutely. So uh, we'll definitely have to have you back on the show um, yeah, again. For sure. That would be awesome. For sure. And we'll Thanks. dive a little bit deeper into some of that memory lane. Awesome, I think that'd be yeah. great. And thanks for co-hosting with me. Yeah, no, I had a fun time. Excellent. Thanks for being here, man. Awesome. Thanks awesome. for inviting me. Absolutely. Thanks, awesome. Danny. Anytime. That was another episode of the Empire Boxing Podcast. I'm your host, Jana, and my co-host, Daniel Norman, and our special guest, Manny Sabral. We will see you next time. Subscribe to our YouTube for more. Boxing fans, we have another event just around the corner. The takeover to the uprising is just a couple months away. March 25th, we will see you back at the Grand Villa Casino in Burnaby. Check out our website, empireboxing.live, and head there to get your tickets today. Make sure to listen, follow, and subscribe to Empire Boxing on Apple, Spotify, and YouTube.